all of them apply. So lots of interesting information in this chapter for you. So we're going to start by looking at... Hi Chris! We're going to start by looking at um, altitude as an environmental factor. Yeah. Um, so there's quite a lot of learning objectives for this chapter because there's so many pieces of it. So they look in a lot of detail at altitude, um, quite a lot of detail at heat, not quite as much as the previous edition. They've beefed up the altitude information in this edition. Um, and also the cold. So there's quite a few kind of pointers on the objective list of things that you want to make sure you've covered there, okay? All right, so um, just some terminology, first of all. Um, so I, I always called it barometric pressure. Um, this book also calls it atmospheric pressure. Uh, how much uh, push, really, is being exerted by the air above us out to the atmosphere. All right, so at sea level, that's 760 millimeters of mercury. And that should be ringing some bells because we talked about um, pressure when we looked at uh, ventilation and breathing. Okay. Um, temperature uh, is the current temperature of the air in the immediate surrounding area and saturation um, is equivalent to the relative humidity. So what's the percentage of water being held in the air? Okay. Um, and then this table from the book just shows you uh, the gases that are in the air as a percentage. So we're interested in oxygen, 20.914 rather, and carbon dioxide, 0 0.03. All right. Nitrogen is the highest, but it doesn't have any impact on us as humans. We don't create it at any point, and we don't use nitrogen from the air for anything. So um, the pressure of the oxygen, partial pressure is 159.2, and for carbon dioxide is 0.24. Okay, so those partial pressures should be bringing back, hopefully, some memories of the chapter on ventilation and respiration. Okay. All right, so... Um, When we're at sea level, um, our oxygen saturation is at 100%. All right. So remember that when we're looking at oxygen saturation in the blood, we're looking at hemoglobin. How much of the hemoglobin has oxygen attached to it? So at sea level, that should be 100% if you're healthy. Okay. As we get higher in altitude, then that changes, okay? So by just under two and a half thousand feet, we start to see some decline in aerobic performance. So um, at Eastern here in Portales, we're around 4,000 feet. So that means that if you're here as an athlete or if you're here as a coach, that, um, if you bring athletes here who have grown up and lived and trained at sea level, you're going to have to give them a little bit of time because their aerobic performance will go down a little bit. All right. So the really big declines don't start until around 5,000 feet. So it's not going to be like, oh, I can't run, I can only walk but the run is going to be probably slower and a little bit more hard work. By the time we get over to Albuquerque, 
we're over our 5,000 feet. Albuquerque is at six, six and a half down on the plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, six, six and a half down in the bowl of the valley there where most of the city is. So um, you're over that 5,000 foot limit there. You're going to see some pretty big um, impact on aerobic performance. Okay. Um, and when when you read uh, textbooks or articles and they're talking about altitude, the typical definition used is 5,000 feet. So they're talking about anything over 5,000 feet. By uh, 7,200, declines are really becoming pretty significant. So that's the kind of threshold for a very dramatic effect in aerobic performance. Um, again, around here, you don't have to go very far to be over 7,200 feet. Rodoso is high, higher than that. Cloudcroft is nearly 10,000. Um, if you go to Albuquerque and you go up the back side of the mountain, up to Sandia Peak, that's 10,000. So there's a lot of places in the state where we're over that threshold and we can expect uh, things to get a little bit difficult, all right? Um, so what we see is impaired oxygen consumption, so VO2 goes down, right? I don't manage to get oxygen into the bloodstream or into the muscle tissue as effectively as normal, and therefore we see endurance performances decline, all right? And um, we start to rely more on anaerobic metabolism of ATP because we see a decline, again, there's not the oxygen, not as much oxygen available at the end of the electron transport chain to pick up those hydrogen ions, right? And so oxidative metabolism doesn't work as well and we have to use a little bit more anaerobic work. So if you do any kind of high altitude winter sports, so if you go downhill skiing um, or snowboarding um, or if you snowshoe or cross country ski, or if you do a lot of hiking up in, the, in um, the mountains or if you go mountain climbing, then you're frequently over 2,700 meters, which is around 8,000. 8,000 feet, I think. Can't convert meters to feet in my head. All right? So when we're in Portales, right, if you stand up on the bridge that crosses the road from Greyhound Arena to, to the main campus, if you stand there and look out, you can see maybe 60 miles down towards Roswell, right? It's very easy to forget that we're at altitude because we're flat as a bleeding pancake here, right? And so you just forget that our flatness is actually at 4,000 feet, right? So what causes some of these performance challenges, all right? So the number one problem is hypoxia. So hypoxia it, um, stands for um, less oxygen saturation in the bloodstream. All right. So that leads to less oxygen delivery to our target tissues. All right. And it's because the, of the decrease in barometric pressure. It isn't that the percentage of oxygen goes down, right? People often um, are mistakenly, uh, mistakenly thinking that there's less oxygen available at higher altitudes. That isn't technically true, right? The percentage of oxygen in the air at any altitude is exactly the same, 20.93, right? It doesn't change. What changes is the partial pressure of that oxygen within the air, all right? 
So the partial pressure goes down. And remember our high to low, right? And our car going down the slope, right? As the slope gets less steep, it gets harder and harder to move oxygen across the membranes, right? So the difficulty is getting oxygen in and around and then even more from the bloodstream into the muscle tissue, right? Um, so, um, the higher the altitude, the less tension, the less pressure there is, right? And so aerobic performances of any kind get impacted quite dramatically, all right? So another factor that happens as we move up in altitude is that the air temperature becomes increasingly cooler, all right? So, um, at the top of Sandia Peak, in the middle of summer, I wouldn't say it's cold, but it's a lot, lot cooler than it is down in town, right? So down in town might be 95 or 100 degrees, up on the mountain it's probably 80 degree, right? It's lovely, <laughs> right? So we get this cooler air as we move up, Right? And then we see an increased risk of dehydration. So the cooler the air is, the less water vapor it can hold. All right? And that's another gradient issue. Right? So the cooler the air is, the less water vapor, the drier the air is. And so then we lose more water when we're sweating. And from our, um, from our mucous membranes in our throat and our mouth and our nose, all right? Particularly if we com um, combine that with doing some exercise at this altitude, all right? So we get much higher levels of evaporation, means that we have to be really careful with our hydration status, right? I have to drink more often, okay? And then our last issue with altitude is the fact that we have increased solar radiation, right? We are literally closer to the sun, okay? So the, we're closer and the atmosphere is thinner at this point, right? So that means that we're at much greater risk of sunburn. So even if you're up doing winter sports, you must wear your sunscreen because not only have you got the sun and if you're doing winter sports you have the sun bouncing off the snow into your face as well so it's quite frequent for people to come back from skiing holidays with sunburn right because they don't think about putting on sunscreen really important to use your sunscreen right does mean that we get good vitamin D production which makes us feel good right but that's, that sunburn means there's DNA damage in your skin, and that can lead to skin cancer, okay? All right, so we've seen the sea level version of this diagram before, right? So the one on the left is the same as the one that we had in the um, respiratory chapter. All right. So the one on the left here is based at sea level, and the partial pressure of oxygen coming in is higher than the partial pressure in the lungs, and so some oxygen can cross from the lungs, from the air into the lungs, and then the partial pressure of the oxygen coming in through the pulmonary artery is very low, right? Because the body's used up the oxygen. So it's easy to dump oxygen into the bloodstream. Okay, we come round to the left ventricle, uh, the left aorta, um, <laughs> down into the left ventricle, out around the body, 
down to our muscle tissue. We have a nice steep gradient here between the bloodstream and the muscle tissue, 60 millimeters of mercury. So it's easy for oxygen to cross over into the working muscles and help with making ATP, right? However, when we go up in altitude, and this is high, 4,300 meters is high. That is, where's my, 4,300 is around 13,000 feet or so. So this is, this is the other extreme. You'd have to go up, ooh, Pikes Peak is Pikes Peak. In Colorado, 13,000? I think so. Yeah, I think Pikes Peak is 13,000. Um, so you'd have to, you'd have, this, is a, this is a pretty extreme example. All right? So you can see here that the overall partial pressure of the atmosphere has dropped from 760 to 460. All right? Partial pressure of oxygen has dropped from 150 to 96. The partial pressure in the lungs is 46, so we still have a steep enough gradient. It's not like I can't breathe, right? Air will move into my lungs. Then the situation is a little bit different when we're looking at the partial pressure in the bloodstream. So in the blood coming from the right ventricle through the, the pulmonary artery, the partial pressure of oxygen is down to 27 from 40. All right. Comes into the lungs, so we've got a 46 to 27 gradient. That's enough, I can get oxygen into the bloodstream. Right? It's not as good as it was at sea level, but getting the oxygen into the bloodstream isn't the biggest problem. Right? So, my blood leaves my lungs at 42 instead of 100, comes round out of the ventricle around the body, it's at 42. We get to the muscle tissue and here's where the biggest problem occurs. All right? The drop in pressure, partial pressure of oxygen inside the muscle tissue. Right? So it's down from 40 to 27 leaves us a gradient of only 15 millimeters of mercury instead of 60, right? That's a big difference right there, okay? So this is the biggest problem. This is difficult, but manageable, right? From the lungs into the bloodstream. The biggest problem is from the bloodstream into the muscle tissue. And that's where the issue lies because we said weeks ago, it's all very well having oxygen available in the bloodstream, but I can't make ATP in my bloodstream, right? I have to have the oxygen in the muscle tissue to make ATP, right? So this gradient is so low that the oxygen kind of trickles across into the muscle tissue and, and the muscles just can't work at the intensity that you, you're used to, right? They can't produce oxygen, so instead of running, you have to walk, right? Or crawl, in my case. I have been known to crawl up during the snowshoe race on Sandia Peak. So, um, right, it's really difficult, okay? Any questions about that change? No, I'm, I'm good. You're good? Okay. Yeah. Just what? like, I can actually relate to what you're, you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> in the New Mexico, it was like difficult getting used to the, the altitude. Right. Uh, yeah. At first, I'm thinking like, whoa, I'm, I'm like really unfit. No, you were, it was, yeah, it's this, right? Because you came from Jamaica. Yeah. Straight here? Oh gosh, yeah, big difference. Yeah. All right. So
So what is happening? These are the challenges that we're facing physiologically. What actually happens other than the oxygen movement at the muscle tissue, right? So the first thing that happens is we get an increase in our resting heart rate. So Chris, for you, maybe when you were at home in Jamaica, your resting heart rate was maybe 58, 62 beats per minute. And when you first came here, it was more like 68 or 72 beats per minute, right, initially. Um, and that happens in response to the lower levels of oxygen in the body, right? The, the heart rate increases to try to get more oxygen around the body, all right? Blood pressure goes up initially, and as we've said, oxygen transport is decreased because we have lower hemoglobin saturation as we get higher up in altitude. So our overall VO2 max goes down, um, and that can be anywhere from 2 to 15%, so it could be quite dramatic at, at part, in part. Um, cardiac output goes down, um, and then we'll start to see increased hemoglobin concentrations after time. All right, so that takes a little bit of time to see that happen, but that drop in oxygen stimulates the kidneys to produce aldosterone, and that stimulates the red blood cells to produce more, the marrow to produce more red blood cells and hemoglobin. Aldosterone. It's too long for my brain. Right? So it's not just in the cardiovascular system that we see some differences, right? We also see differences in the respiratory system. So our breathing rates change. Okay? So particularly above 10,000 feet, um, our, when we're resting, we start to breathe more deeply rather than faster. So the first thing that happens is we breathe a lot more deeply. All right? um, when we are lower than 10,000 feet, we don't see that change in breathing at rest, but we do see it when we're exercising. All right? When we start to exercise then at altitude, we get um, the tidal volume, so my, my breath gets deeper, and then it also gets faster to try to um, compensate for less oxygen crossing over the membrane. Right. So when we're trying to work as hard as we can, Maximal exercise is maximal exercise. So my max ventilation is my max, whether I'm at sea level or at altitude, right? So that could be my kind of ceiling. That's it. My pulmonary ventilation can't get any higher than that, right? I can't breathe more deeply and I can't breathe faster, okay? Um, the oxyhemoglobin curve shifts to the left because instead of being acidic when we see it shift to the right, it gets more alkaline um, and shifts to the left and we're losing a lot more carbon dioxide at that point. So that's similar to that swimming example I gave you uh, back in that other chapter is, you know, we're breathing deeper and faster and we're blowing off carbon dioxide and so we get this alkaline situation. Right? Um, the kidneys can compensate somewhat by shifting the levels of the molecules that they're excreting so they start to shift 
more bicarbonate. Um, and over time, so now you've been here long enough, right, you wouldn't notice that you're breathing deeper or you're breathing faster anymore, right? So uh, we see adaptation in the cardiovascular system, but also in our pulmonary ventilation. Okay, so that's cardiovascular, ventilation, and then we have to look at what happens with our ATP production, right? Because that's clearly crucial to an athlete, right? And so, because we're not getting as much oxygen into the muscle tissue in an acute phase, so this is like, um, even here, even living here at 4,000 feet, right? If I pack up my tent and go to Cloudcroft for the weekend camping, that 6,000 switch overnight is an immediate acute situation, right? And so what happens then is within that acute situation, we have to start to rely on glycolysis again, breaking down carbohydrate to make ATP. Okay, so that means that I see increases in blood lactate, which represents a, an increase in hydrogen ions within the muscle tissue. And so it, you get fatigued a lot more quickly, all right? also means that you're going to absolutely crave carbohydrates, right? So you better hope you pack some good pasta or rice to cook in your little saucepan over your campfire because you really do start to crave the carbs, okay? And your body switches back from using, it can't use fats anaerobically, remember? So in glycolysis, the only fuel I can use is carbohydrate. Right, so we start to rely a lot more on our carbohydrate again, and we will start to use uh, stored glycogen in our muscle tissue and possibly in our liver. So you really do get tired and fatigued much, much more quickly. All right? Now, if we're only at moderate altitudes, so moderate from four to like, seven, six, seven, right? Then people who've been there long enough so that we've got some chronic adaptation by now, right? Then those acclimatized people tend to rely a lot more on lipids and fats than we would if we weren't acclimatized. So once we get used to being at altitude, the body's really clever at adapting our ATP production so that it can switch back to aerobic metabolism and use some of those fats that last a lot longer, right? But that takes time. It doesn't happen in a week, right? Any questions to there? I'm good. Good? All right. Yeah. So, um, this, these two graphs are in the book. Um, and I know graphs tend to give us the heebie-jeebies, but I actually think these are not that hard to understand. And they're really fascinating. And you can't see them properly. They're blurred out on the slide. So I would really recommend taking a look at them in the textbook. Um, so if we're looking at short duration performance, so um, like under 20 minutes, right, then we're only looking at the aerobic activities that would be affected. So if I'm a sprinter, I'm a jumper, I'm a thrower, we really shouldn't see 
any decrease in performance at altitude because they're all using ATP PC or the first part of glycolysis. They're not getting anywhere close to using oxygen to make ATP. All right? So those anaerobic performances should not be having a problem. And I say should not because we'll look at some other things that can happen. All right? So the altitude itself is minimal um, for even short aerobic activities. So if I'm doing um, what would be, so like a 400 meter hurdle, it hovers around, I think, that three minute mark. It's a killer event, right? And so you might see a little bit of impact there, but maybe not. Um, so there could be some psychology going on, preparation. Right? Our long duration stuff is where we really see the impacts. All right? So we see speed go down a lot. All right? And let me try and see if I can see this without the light on. Here we go. So, for example, um, let's look at the left hand side, the male performance. So the x axis is altitude and the y axis is speed as a percentage of their sea level speed, right? So the dotted line in the middle here is sea level. And then what we see is if it's um, a 50 meter, 100 meter, 200 meter, the times speeds are actually faster. And that's because there's less air pressure, right? So they actually get better times in those events. You quite often see world records for sprints and especially for throwing at altitude, right? But if you start 400 meters, is starting to look more normal. And then a lot slower than I would be at sea level as my 800 meter, my 50, my mile, my 5,000, my 10,000, and my marathon. So you can see, here's my speed for my marathon compared to my marathon in London. Right? So that's a big drop off in speed. We have to, you have to be sure to prepare your athletes for that, right? Because they're like, God damn, I'm going as fast as I can and I feel like I'm running backwards. <laughs> so, you know, it's important that they understand what is going on there, I think. Um, do I want to change that slide? No, not yet. Okay, so um, adaptations that we see um, will be increases in red blood cell count that starts around, if I remember correctly, around three weeks. Um, and if I've got increases in red blood cell count, I have increases in hemoglobin. So even though I'm not 100% saturation, I've got more oxygen available in the bloodstream than I had before the adaptation occurred. Okay. Um, and so one of the suggestions from the research is that athletes live high but train low. So what that means is that you want to try to, so let's say, let's bring it back here because this is, this is the easiest really to talk about. Let's say you live in Rio Doso. Right? So you get the benefit of living at altitude, you sleep at altitude, you eat at altitude, but you drive to Roswell to do your training. Right? And Roswell is the, about the same as us or a little bit. It always feels like you're going downhill somehow to Roswell, but I don't know if that's no, true. It's quite right, boss. Because you pop off the edge of the plane, don't you, as you go in. 
So Roswell might be a little bit lower than us, but it's about the same, right? So you, you live in Rio Doso, but you don't want to train in Rio Doso because your intensity and the volume and the work output is so much lower, right? So you come and train in Roswell, now you've got all these extra red blood cells carrying all this extra oxygen, and you can train pretty hard in Roswell, and then go home and get the benefits. So live high, train low, or lower anyway, right? That's kind of the recommendation from the research. Um, because you don't want to train at those high altitudes too much, right? If you look at the Olympic Training Center is in Colorado, but it's in Colorado City, not in Denver, right? So there's quite a big difference in altitude between those two cities, apparently, right? Um, so, I don't know if I want to do this now. Yes, let me do this now, because then we will do altitude sickness on Friday. Um, okay, so, you may or may not have seen these uh, masks that, um, that will, the, the advertising and the marketing um, will tell you that wearing the mask is like being at altitude, all right? Um, so it says, and this is an old version from this website. When I looked at it the last time, they had updated it and corrected some of these statements because they were really, really inaccurate when they were first up there, right? But this is, you know, that initial marketing, it might be what you end up hearing. So it increases your ability to process oxygen. No, it doesn't, <laughs> right? You process oxygen inside the mitochondria, inside muscle cells. So no, wearing a mask doesn't help you process oxygen, right? That's just nonsense. Um, and they, they say that you, you get the benefit of high altitude training without having to go up the mountain. Again, that's not entirely true. Um, because they don't change oxygen saturation, right? Really what they do is create more resistance, so you have to breathe harder. So really what they do is they train your respiratory muscles so that you can take a bigger breath, right? They don't really, um, and then they say things like they condition your lungs. No, you can't condition lung tissue. It's like jello, right? It, it doesn't change. There's no adaptation in lung tissue, so that's not true, right? Um, your lungs will be trained to take a deeper breath not exactly true. The respiratory muscles can change the volume of your thoracic cavity more so that you can take a deeper breath, right? It has nothing to do with the lung tissue, okay? So these are the kinds of things that as an educated scientist, right, you can hear these comments made about things and go, no, 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 that's not how that works, right? Because they made a lot of money off of these initially. Um, I don't know how popular they still are. Um, let's see. Uh, increase the elasticity of the alveoli. No, you can't do that because there's no contractile element in the alveoli, right? So you can't change anything to do with the lung tissue. So you just have to be a little bit cynical. Would wearing one of these while you're training help you to take bigger and deeper breaths when you're up at altitude? Very possibly. Does it have anything to do with oxygen? 
Not really, right? I mean, you might get a, you get a little bit more oxygen possibly into the muscle tissue, but only if you've got the red blood cell count increase to pick up the oxygen, right? So it's a little bit of a scam in my view. On the other hand, I have to own up, I've never tried one. Have you ever tried one, Ryan? No. Nah. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen like football players on the television wearing them when they're playing Denver or somewhere, but I just don't, I mean, it, it doesn't get more oxygen. You can't wear it on the day and get more oxygen into your body. That's just not, that, that's a fallacy. Okay, so, yeah, I think that's where I'm going to stop for today. Um, Friday, I want to look at altitude sickness, and I will probably, because they cut the altitude sickness section down a little bit in this edition of the book, so I will probably pad it out just a little bit because of where we live. I think it's important that you understand how serious that can be and what the symptoms are so that you can recognize it if you or anyone you're with is beginning to develop that. So I'll pad that out just a fraction um, and then we will move on. We've got just a couple of slides here on altitude and then we'll start the, um, the heat information. Okay? Okay. All right. If you have any questions, if you think of anything, you know, now, you, as you said, you've had first-hand experience of this, right? Yeah. So, as it's kind of mulling through your head, even if you're not thinking about it purposely, it, it could still be floating around in there, setting off our ideas. So, if, if anything comes up and you want to um, wanna ask, we've got lab tomorrow and we've got office hours tomorrow. I've got office hours this afternoon, but I think they're fully booked with students. So, um, you, if, if you, something comes up, you can try, but I have a feeling that I have no spare time in office hours this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So, all right. Okay, well. Apparently tomorrow is going to be even hotter than today, which is insane. Um, and I'm sprinkling the dirt in the backyard like crazy, trying to make some weeds grow or something grow so that when the wind blows, I don't get this much dirt on the windowsill because it's driving me nuts. Um, Anything else? What have I forgotten? Tomorrow's lab will be doing chapter 15, so it won't be an actual lab. It'll be more a lecture because there isn't time in the schedule to do chapter 15 in class. So it will be a very brief look at chapter 15. Okay? Okay. Alrighty. Well, have a good rest of your day. Stay safe, wear your masks, and I'll see you tomorrow. Right, take care, see you tomorrow. Bye.